I think we're missing, like even even in like church culture, we're missing what masculinity actually is. We're actually really, really confused. Mm. And I'm taking a shot because as much deconstruction that goes on, and it's good. We need to have deconstruction of of toxic ideas and domineering masculinity or whatever. Like, but where's the construction? Mm. Like, where's the? What are we actually shooting for? Like, what's the what's the top of the the puzzle box that we can look at it and go, okay, that's what we're supposed to do. That's the vision. Yeah, and so I'm I'm taking a shot at that by saying I think I, I think I can propose something that is remarkably resonant with with men and women when they hear that this is what women what men are supposed to be. Hello and welcome to another episode of Trevor Talks podcast. You know where we talk to real people about real topics and real stories. Today's guest is an author, nationally syndicated radio host, and advocate for healing children through Cure International. He's won National Personality of the Year awards for his work in his offbeat and quirky radio show, which airs on more than 200 stations. His podcast with his friend and radio producer, Sherry Lynn, the Brant and Sherry Oddcast, has been downloaded more than 10 million times. 10 million people. I'm not even joking. It's been 10 million times. His new book, The Men We Need, is available everywhere right now, and I'm so excited to have him on the show. Please help me welcome Mr. Brant Hansen. Brant, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. I, I feel welcome. I'm like, at this point, after doing this deep dive that I was telling you before we started recording, I'm like, is this healthy for me to be doing this interview? Because everybody's <laughs> going to be like, all right, Trevor doesn't know what he's doing. We need to go listen to Brant. <laughs> this episode can be called no. the Brant Talks episode. I'm like, dang, dude, you've been around well, the block. <laughs> well, yeah, I was just like two days ago, I became a grandpa and I'm totally feeling my age now. So <laughs> I should be, I should be going towards that mentoring role by now. I I, like that aged me instantly just two days ago, like becoming a grandpa. So Jeez. yeah, I have. Well, congratulations! Thanks. You want to talk about your grandkid? Most grandpas want to talk about their grandkids. So yeah, there you go. well, I'll start. Two days with worth. One of the uh, <laughs> one of the, her chief characteristics, I would say, so far is that she's very small. She's like eight pounds, and for humans, that's that's tiny. Um, yeah, she's pr it's very short as well, and she's she gurgles, and her name is Scout. Scout? And, um, yeah, like I from To Kill a Mockingbird. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. cool. And um, I'm very proud of my daughter and her husband, and they're going to be great parents. But this is really, really fun, like to have a baby. I, I really like little kids, so like I've, I've missed this a lot. So, yeah. Come on. Well, that's an amazing milestone to go through. It's like I haven't had my first child. I haven't been married. I'm not dating. So I'm a little bit away from that. But – what tips do you have for any potential grandfathers out there? Oh, well, let's see. The experience that I've accrued in the last mm -hmm. oh, 40 to 48 hours. Mm -hmm. um, uh, enjoy the time because it goes so fast. Like two days ago, I never – like she's already added an ounce. Jeez, like, dude. Yeah. It gets away from – Grown so, like a tree. Yeah. So, you know, I'll draw on my experience with that. But so far, it's That's just – so sweet to have a little baby resting on your chest again, like sitting oh, on the wow. couch. I mean, come on. Yeah. It's, it's I love very that. Awesome. And this will be the tagline for the next book on being a grandpa. But I first want to talk about the new book that you've just recently put out. And you called it The Men We Need. What can you tell us about the book and how this message came about? Yeah. So I'm not the guy that would normally write a book like this. Uh, I'm sure. not. I'm not into outdoors. I have actually have neurological problems. I can't see straight, and so I can't hunt or anything. I don't have any problem with that stuff. But I, last time I was on a motorcycle, I ran into a parked truck, and that's not a joke. Like, I totally did. Wow. And so I can't pull that off. Um, there's a lot. I play the flute. There's a lot of things that would disqualify me from writing this book or probably any it's book. really manly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but... I think we're missing, like even even in like church culture, we're missing what masculinity actually is. We're actually really really confused, mm -hmm. and I'm taking a shot because as much deconstruction that goes on, and it's good. We need to have deconstruction of of toxic ideas and domineering masculinity or whatever. Like, but where's the construction? 
Mm. Like, where's the, what are we actually shooting for? Like, what's the, what's the top of the the puzzle box that we can look at it and go, okay, that's what we're supposed to do. That's the vision. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm taking a shot at that by saying, I think I, I think I can propose something that is remarkably resonant with, with men and women when they hear that this is what women, what men are supposed to be. And so I, I put that forward as an idea and then to kind of flesh that out what that looks like you know that's what the men we need is but it's it's all based on the idea that god gave adam this job as keeper of the garden mm. and so i unpack what that actually means and the cool thing about that is you can it doesn't matter whether you're artsy or you know outdoorsy or what it doesn't matter you can do this and yeah. uh it's incredibly fulfilling and it's life-giving to the people around you the, the vulnerable people around you get to flourish and that's what's cool about it yeah. And the interesting thing is I've never been your average guy. I don't like fishing. I don't like hunting. I'm not good at sports and I hate the taste of barbecue. So like <laughs> barbecue sauce, I will say barbecue sauce. I hate the taste of it. If I'm eating barbecue, it's going to be dry rub. You know, it's got to be good season stuff. But awesome. I, I'm, I've, I'm never one to catch the football. If I see something flying at me, I'm going to run the other way, like, or get out of the way from it. And I, up until maybe a few years ago, I was always wondering, like, there was always that toxic masculinity thing going on. And I was um, heavily impacted negatively by that. Like, oh, you're not a guy, you do this. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of uh, picking on, like, in my younger years, just because I didn't relate with all of those things. Like, I'm not going to play football. I'm not baseball. None of that. It wasn't my thing, but that doesn't make me any less of a man than I was created to be. Like no, yeah, it, it, when I was four or something like that, I'd prance around like I heard Shania Twain's man, I feel like a woman the first time, and I was sold. I didn't know whether I wanted to be Shania or marry her yet, but <laughs> right, right. I was game for it, you know. <laughs> well, th- this is just it. Cause I, this is actually really good news if you think about that in these terms, like what keeping the garden really means. So it it does mean you keep people safe around you. And uh, but that's that's beyond just flexing and having a gun or whatever. That's just we're talking about with your words, like the people around you should be more secure because you're there. Your neighborhood should be safer because you're there, because you're paying attention and because you care about people. Um, But like you don't have to fit all of this other stereotypical stuff. And the weird thing is, even in church culture, we have this. We still have this stuff. And I I had to tell my publisher up front, like they're like, what do you want? We, We got some ideas for the cover of the book i'm like do not do like a silhouette of some guy climbing a rock or whatever because <laughs> oh yeah because i don't do that and it, not, again nothing against it at all but if you're if you're a programmer you're an artist you're like whatever whoever you are this role is resonant mm. this idea that like what a gardener does is there's species that can exist in a garden that would not survive in the survival of the fittest wilderness. But you create this space in your life where your sphere of influence is they do survive and they flourish and bloom. We're talking about the vulnerable, the weak, the uh, the people who are counted out. Uh, if you do get married, it's your wife, it's your kids, it's, the, it's your neighbors, it's people you work with. Whatever your, whatever your position in life is, it still counts. And as I talk to guys about it, they generally are like, that's it. Yeah. That is what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to do that. And when I talk to women about it, when women read this book, they're like, that's exactly it. This is exactly what resonates with us about what's actually even attractive in a man. So you can be ripped. You can be you know, totally jacked, incredible abs. But if you actually make – let's say you're married. You make your wife feel less secure. Mm. She'll actually resent your abs. She'll find mm-hmm. you less attractive because you're you're – actually a threat to the garden. You're actually an intruder. She needs it to be secure. But like if you're flirting with other women or you're constantly idolizing your own body or something like that, now you're not attractive. Conversely, a guy who's not that great looking or anything, not remarkable, if he does exude this, women are drawn to it. A wife is very attracted. There is hope. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like... (laughs) It's true Where? though. Like I, I, I'm telling guys, like that's not why you should buy the book, but it is true. Yeah. Like women see this and they're like, "That's what a man is supposed to be." I get it. Yeah, and. Where did all of this come from? Like, these are such needed topics. This sounds very personal to you. Where did this come from? 
Um, I think a couple of things. Honestly, my producer is a, is a brilliant woman. She's single and she's in her 40s. Absolutely brilliant. She comes from a family of, of tough guys. And hmm. she was a little stunned that she was even working on a show with a guy like me, like totally different, playing with puppets on the air and stuff, doing weird stuff. I do miming on the air, on the radio. And like, <laughs> there's no there's no way to describe this. She's like, this is so strange. But then what she said, she wrote this in the introduction to the book, because she was the one that encouraged me to write it. She's like, I spent 10 minutes in this guy's house. I'm like, this is different. His daughter, his wife, they feel safe with them. It's very different. And uh, she said, now that's, it's, it's weird to see masculinity play out that way because she was raised in a more traumatic setting. Yeah. And honestly, that's the other place for me. So was I. Like uh, my dad was a pastor, but had a lot of problems. Um, I have forgiven him. I love him. But we went through a couple divorces. We had some institutional settings in there. We had a lot of trauma and drama. And um, I kind of thought, you know what? I'm not going to be like when I get to be a dad or a husband if I ever get married. And so that that had something to do with it, too. I think that where that's that's where a lot of this comes from. Yeah, and the healthy conversation that can be brought into this is like, no one is going to have those perfect parents. Like, right. I love my parents to death. Like, I see them almost every single day just because I love them so much. But there are things that happen in your childhood that maybe they didn't know. Like, when it comes to mental health, um, up until maybe 10 years ago, there was no real spotlight and maybe even sooner than then. Um, that's when I really started struggling and like, there was no accountability on that level yet. Like now it's more of an old thing. Like medication is less taboo. Therapy is less mm -hmm. taboo, but growing up, I didn't really have that, um, outlet to express that because I had three brothers that were super masculine wrestling state champions, all that stuff. And I was just like, yeah, no, like <laughs> not at huh. all. That's not me. And, yeah. um, so I was the oddball out. But hearing you say this and hearing her, uh, Sherry's experience through it all, it's fascinating to think about the diversity of men there are out there, whether they're husbands, dads, single, whatever. Like you can look at a person and in a very unjudgmental way, obviously, tell mm -hmm. that they're different from you. And that's an interesting thing to point out. Why do you think 2022 was the perfect season for that? Hmm. Um, for being able to point this out? To people like this is the yeah. keeper of the garden thing well i mean there's yeah. the larger there's the larger societal discussion about gender and mm -hmm. a lot of that can be good a lot of it i think is harmful but like it, i i when i wrote this i'm like i don't want to write an academic treatise because there's there's people that are more educated than me they love they can put it in that space and i think that's all that's all wonderful to to discuss that from a from a pr perspective from a different perspectives Sure. What I was trying to do, though, is just on the ground, guys don't know what they're supposed to be doing. Like, so it's 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 more like trying to write Proverbs. I'm, obviously, that's scripture. I'm not writing scripture, but try, trying to impart wisdom to, to how actually how to live in a way that is life giving to people around us and makes sense so that we have some kind of vision for our lives. Because if you don't know what the vision is, what the heck? We could, I don't think people know. Like th there's, there's entire very well thought out academic books that are written from a Christian perspective, deconstructing, you know, mas toxic masculinity. It's good, but it's like, okay, but what's the construction again? Like, what are we supposed to be doing that is distinctly masculine? Because God's image is masculine, it is male and female. There has to be beautiful aspects to both those things that are, that are distinct. Those, those words must have some content. And it's interesting to me that he started by giving Adam this job. He gave Eve this amazing role of Azer. It's E-Z-E-R. It's used elsewhere in the Old Testament to describe God himself coming to rescue with his armies. Like we translate that like one time in the Old Testament, we translate it helpmate. And it's not really fair because it doesn't capture the significance of her role. I mean, she's made to co-rule with him, but he has this job of keeper of the garden. And when they blow it, God comes looking for him. 
He says, Adam, where are you? What happened to you? What what'd you do? Like I made you to be the keeper of this place. So I think there's something beautiful with that. I think I think now is the time because we lack so much clarity with it. And I, I do hope it's a blessing to to consider it. Yeah. And I do like fully believe that it is. And after hearing your take on the garden and what it means to be a keeper and even the little bits that you've shared about your story so far, it really drives me to want to hear like your story, like the story behind Brant Hansen, the guy who you may hear on the radio or on the I am second videos, Ted talks like, would you mind sharing your story with us? Oh no. Well, I don't know where to start, but I, I, I'll tell you, I mean, I am, I am on the autism spectrum. So I, I share that with people. That's been an, a lifelong revelation and a very helpful explanatory device in retrospect like <laughs> so like the, the woman i'm married to we're about to have our 32nd anniversary she's the only girlfriend wow. i've ever had i didn't date anybody in high school uh we were best pals in college and we were studying one night no romantic nothing because i've never like never had any sort of girlfriend really and i turned to her and just blurted out i love you we were just we were just good friends and she was like uh thanks and so it kind of took off from there but that's me um and it's wild that i wound up in radio doing what i'm doing but what helps i think is if you have what we used to call asperger's or or autism spectrum disorders called you can be very blunt and very honest to a fault i mean my mom used to tell me, you don't have to be honest all the time like, and just say everything bluntly, but it makes for a really compelling radio. And I am being honest. And I don't, I'm, not, I'm not trying to hurt anybody. I ask God, please let my, my words add value to people, not curse them, not, not subtract value. I want to be a blessing, not a curse. And I think he's answered that. I think it's very unlikely that I didn't even set out to be a radio host per se. I was a newsman and it just, it mutated this direction. Um, but it is a pretty sweet story in retrospect because I get to use all this. And you, you mentioned it in the bio. This is, this is me, tr I think, trying to be a keeper of the guard in my own way. But I get to use my entire platform for these hospitals. Wow. Um, that are all about Jesus and healing kids that have these disabilities. So they go from not walking, they're 15 years old, can't walk. And now they can because they got a surgery they never could have afforded otherwise. We do it for free. We pray over them. The surgeons pray over them. In the hospitals, their parents are loved, like counseled, prayed with, kept there. Like they get to stay there. They're fed. These people are loved like never before. And they're people who are all told they're, they're cursed. And that's why they have a disability or a disabled child. So we say, no, you're not cursed. God loves you, and we're going to heal your child. And we do it by the thousands. They last year we did 13,000 surgeries, all overtly about the gospel. And we're in countries that are, some of them are 99% Muslim, and we heal their kids. And we tell them about Jesus. And uh, to me, that is, I, I get to use my words to, to, to buttress that work. Mm -hmm. And that's protecting these little vulnerable blossoms they get to blossom so i think it's i think it's neat that i've gotten to do that i think every i think everybody has opportunities like that and they're always god will use if you if you want him to you ask him to he'll use whatever skills you have to his glory as the keeper of the garden if you just if that's what you want to do and that's i didn't plan it and but that's how it worked out so i didn't mean to go on for too long no i love it and it's funny to hear the similarities. I'm very awkward around women too. Uh, so <laughs> that's great. I mean, hence, <laughs> not in the dating scene at this point, but that's, that's not just you, man. Um, I'm 24. It's like, I always get the question, which it, it used to be annoying, but now I use it to like play a joke. You know, I think it's funny. It's like, when are you going to start dating? It's like, I don't know. She ain't here yet. <laughs> you yeah. know, like I can't figure I, that's the only answer I have. And it's okay. Like for the longest time, I used to think like, oh, I need to start dating because X, Y, and Z. And it's like, there is no blueprint to success. 
There no. is no roadmap to how your life should be going. Uh, some people become successful in their career before the age of 25. Some people blossom around the age of 35, like some 45, 50. You never know what God has in store for you. You just have to trust and know that he has something for you. And if you feel him calling, my golly, go after it. Right. You know what? I have, a lot of, I have I have a lot of respect for what you're doing, too, because a lot of guys just kind of check out into themselves. And so you're creating stuff. Yeah. Like you're, you're putting things out there again to add value to people's lives. Even it, it, That's that's not normal anymore. Yeah. Like so. So you're going to be growing and, and becoming the man that you can be. And uh, but honestly, you know how it is. Like a lot of guys, they're, they are. They're not going to grow up. No, so. and uh, hearing you say that means a lot. Like I said before, uh, we started recording. Like seeing all that you've been able to accomplish, not even just in career, but hearing your story. It's like I, when we started connecting for this last week, it was like, um, it, am I going to be interviewing a mentor? Like you're <laughs> like, looking at your credentials, your family life, and everything. From my perspective, it's just like this guy's been out there, he's doing it. And I love what you're doing with Cure International because like, obviously you've been with the Way FMs of the world and done radio for years, but now you're able to use your giftings, your God-given gifting, the calling that he's given you for your life. And when I hear you talk about Cure International, number one, I could tell it's personal to you. Number two, it's encouraging to know that like there are partners out there that uh -huh. love what you're doing and uh -huh. that you can use your gift to help save lives. So where right. did this partnership come about and how does it feel to just be able to wake up in the morning and know that you're doing media that matters? True. Okay. So true story. I, they asked me to be an MC at a, a Toby Matt concert and I'm a terrible MC. Like you, you, you don't normally like take somebody with Asperger's and say MC a rap hip hop show. It's um, my favorite so, thing to do. <laughs> so they uh normally you go out there and you're like how's everybody doing tonight you know you get all the crowd excited i don't do that like i have a microphone i feel like i don't need to yell like yeah i'm just like well how is everyone this evening <laughs> you know like so anyway they asked me to do that and they said hey when you go out there make sure you tell everybody here's uh, among the announcements uh text this number to cure and they can give five dollars or whatever. I'm like, what? Wait, what? What's Cure? And a lady was there from Cure, and she explained it to me. And I, I was like, what? This is backstage, like where the food is. Like, mm -hmm. there are permanent hospitals that are overtly about Jesus. It's proclaiming the kingdom and healing the sick, which is exactly what Jesus told us to do. These are permanent hospitals. Yeah, orthopedic surgeries, neurosurgeries. This is what we do. And we train local surgeons. So people from Uganda become brain surgeons and we do it all in the name of Jesus. This is what we do. And I'm like, I have lived weird Christian culture my entire life. I need that. Yeah. I need that. I need to see Jesus. That sounds like Jesus to me, like healing people. And then they go back into their villages and people are freaking out. Like, how is he walking? Like, what happened? It said he was cursed. Like, who did this? That's literally what happens all the time. Like, now that makes sense. Of all the other goofy stuff we do, that <laughs> makes sense. And so I asked him, hey, can I visit a hospital? They're like, yeah, we're, we're planning to open one in the Holy Land in the next year. I'm like, and, that, and it was sort of Palestinians and Israelis. I thought, well, that's really interesting. I'll plan to go there. That'd be a good promotion. That fell through, and they called and like, hey, how would you like to go to Afghanistan instead? And I was like, nope. But they talked me into it, and I wound up going back repeatedly uh, to Kabul and staying in neighborhoods there um, and being at this hospital that was all about Jesus. It's for women and children in Afghanistan, where women are the like the bottom of the status barrel and we were training them to be surgeons like they, they, they couldn't even get medical care before you know while the taliban was in was in charge now they are again but there was that window there but i got hooked on it then and um, so i would make trips to these hospitals and then convince whatever stations i was on to do something for them to, to spread the word get raise money to pay for surgeries and um, 
So that's how it started. Now, now everything I do basically I, is loops back to that because I think it's the best expression of Jesus I've ever seen in my life. Mm. And I, I want people when they think of Christians to think of that stuff because we are doing that, but people, they don't, they didn't have a PR department. And I said, how come I haven't heard about this? And they're like, well, cause we're doctors. We're kind of busy. And so yeah, I was like, Hey, I, I, I can help. I had never heard of it before this, uh, that yeah. I know of anyway, that I know of. Um, yeah, that's something. And hearing this is like, okay, so you said they're in Afghanistan, obviously stuff's hit the fan over the past year in Afghanistan. Are they still operating the hospital in Afghanistan amongst all this? No. And yes. Yeah. So what we do is we tell people about Jesus. We tell people about the kingdom of God and why we're healing them. And we're very overt about it because we think it's both and right. It's like, it's not just enough to do something nice. And it's not just enough to have a bunch of words and like the, the, the miracle of healing, giving people a glimpse of the kingdom of God. Like, and is it, the healing is a trailer for heaven. That's yeah. what healing is. That's why Jesus does it. Right. So, um, but we we weren't able to do that in Afghanistan anymore, and I uh, actually stayed with the same guy when I went named Jerry, a pediatrician from Chicago. He would serve the poor in Lawndale, Chicago, and the uh, uh, suburbs, West Chicago, and then he would go to Afghanistan half the time. He was in Kabul. Great guy, hilarious, big White Sox fan, Filipino American guy, and uh, I didn't go back after I left. After being with him, I stayed with him, and one of our security guards at the hospital went went on his own jihad, and he machine gunned Jerry and killed him, and then killed two other doctors in the parking lot at the hospital. And I, I haven't been back, and we've had to take a lot of. We still support it. We have people who were with Cure who now run it. But we're not able, since we're not able to share the gospel right now, we didn't want to be raising money like from people that are like, hey, we share the gospel and then not actually be doing it. Okay, it would only sense. be half of the mission. Yeah. Yeah. Like, well, from the we, core we, we haven't left, though. I want you to know that we're still, yeah. there's, they're still there doing the surgery. We're still like, but we, yeah. it's just it's just it's been spun off to another org that we yeah. started. Got you. So, Dude, this is crazy. Like, there's this whole other world of media out there that has uh -huh. a meaningful message to it. And it's not just being formed through ad dollars and support the show with this. Like, no, like you're actually fulfilling the great commission with the media work you're doing. And that's encouraging. It really is. Well, good. Think creatively about that for, for you and your your trajectory yeah. and your career. Cause and I'm not just saying this. I don't. I try so hard not to just say religious phrases and cliches. Yeah. Because I, I don't. I can't. I. I can't stand it. Especially with my background of having sermons three times a week and being scared at home. Yeah. You know, if my dad was a pastor, like I don't want to hear Christian stuff mm. out of my mouth if I don't mean it. Yeah. So when I do talk about this, like I'm, I'm telling you, ask God, do pray about this stuff. Ask him. He's looking for partners. Mm. This is what, what he partnered with Abraham. He was looking for a partner. He's been looking for partners, which sounds flippant. Like, well, we're on the same level. We're not on the same level, but he, is, he does want to partner with us. So ask him. And so I, I do think you'll find you'll look back five years from now or maybe two or something and be like, oh, my gosh. Didn't see that coming, but look what I get to yeah. do for the, for the vulnerable and, and using stuff yeah. that I've already been given that I enjoy doing. Yeah. And it's wild over like the past few years of doing this, like the amount of stories that we hear of people overcoming, like specifically in like, um, not taking their own life or like going to therapy, like mental health has been a huge thing in my life. And that's what I'm more so on the vulnerable spectrum from. It's like, we all have our unique pieces and I love that yes. you're pointing that out. Like yes, you're with your more people can join, like let's all do this together, but realize that God has a unique sense of purpose for each and every single one of us. And that's beautiful. It's diversity in the kingdom It's diversity, not only in media, but not everybody needs to hear my story. 
not everyone needs to hear Toby Mac's story. Not everyone needs to hear this, that, and the other. All of our right. stories matter so much and are so equal in that sense. Nobody's better than the next person. But think about two. Yeah. Sorry, I mean interrupt. I'm no, you're good. About, Go ahead. I'm ex- excited about what you're doing. Like, think it's easy for me to see like these, like the the, the before and the afters with these kids. Mm-hmm. Are, will blow you away, especially when they're in video. I was like, "What? <laughs> She's dancing? Wow! She was six years she old. Couldn't walk a couldn't, few days her, ago. Her legs were upside down, practically." With, Sheesh. Um, but in your in your situation, when you're encouraging people, and with the stories that you're you're telling, like that, people are like, "Oh, I did I did get help. I needed that. Things are different. Things are getting better. There were there were brighter days ahead." However, you're that's the same thing. That's that's a bloom that needed care. It needed needed a space. So that you're the space that you're creating. It's it's in cyberland. It's wherever, but it's it's real. Like yeah, it, you're you're creating a space where people get to flourish because you said yes. Yeah, and that's wow. that's what I, that's what I'm talking about. So I think that's I get like that's way more manly, in my opinion, than benching 450. Like I, I just I don't I think that other stuff is is a distraction, and it doesn't like, sound it, fun at all. It's not. Well, I do bench four fifty, but I, the point is, yeah, I knew that, but <laughs> yeah, I know. But that's uh, this that, a side note. Not the, am I jacked? Yeah, but that's not the point. The point is, um, <laughs> it's funny because those things are the trappings. They're they're the outward signifiers of oh, protection. Yeah. Swole, so people, bro. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> dude it's fascinating everyone gets so caught up in oh the physical aspect of this man is a whole lot more masculine than that guy but that guy let's say you got somebody scrawny like me but i'm showing the heart of the father that's masculine You've totally and women, over women there, will one. agree yeah. with you but they again they don't that this is why i think women need to read this book like I would like them to, and I've gotten a good response. Yeah. One guy, one guy is having the girls in, his, in the youth group read this in their own groups. I think that's brilliant mm-hmm. because they deep down get it, but no one's articulated it to them either. It's the same problem. So I've done this in. Um, it's you. You would be amazed. Maybe not. You would get it, but it's really funny when I've spoken to large groups of people at like colleges or high school kids or whatever. I will be talking about, I can't remember what the topic will be, but I'll show some pictures of some real guys from the news. I just Googled guys rescuing things or people. And so it's real guys. Like there's a, there's a, like a Korean soldier who's got a, a, an old lady on his shoulder. He's taking her out of a burning village. There's a guy flying a helicopter, rescuing people off a roof. And after Katrina, there's guys in a ditch, getting a baby out of a car. Um, all of these guys, there's a, there's a, it looks like a guy in India who's caring for a, a child who's on the street. He's, they're all different ethnicities. None of them are male models. They're all real guys. Some of them are overweight. Some like, they just look like normal guys. None of them stand out. Mm-hmm. And I show these, I just fire through these slides real quick. Like, here's this, here's this, here's this, here's this. And I stop afterward. I'm like, Hey, question for the ladies here. Are those guys attractive? And almost before I can finish the question, there's this vociferous, unanimous, yes. Like, uh, guys, take note of that. Because women intuit what, what we're supposed to be. I believe that. Like, they're brilliant. They intuitively know what we're supposed to be. So they're trained in some ways to look for these signifiers of strength and protection. Like, he's willing to be brave because he rides a motorcycle or he's got big big uh, biceps so he's he'd be willing to fight off somebody like but those are so fleeting yeah because you it's it's really about the character of the guy um but it it, it, i'm telling you women are looking for that and Mm -hmm. and if you any guy who embodies that is going to be a hot commodity no matter what he looks like i'm convinced of that honestly and I, i think women listening right now are like dude is right so yeah. yeah, that's insane. And to kind of close this thing out, I really have grown to love ending these episodes with asking a question that's unique to you. Like I'm not asking this to every single guest that comes on the show. So 
as someone who struggles with communication and has made a career within the realm of communication, what is your message to those that may be dealing with the same issues that you've overcame in your life? Oh, I'll say this. It's okay. I'll even widen that out. Like your weakness is your chance. Because if you're awesome, well, then you're awesome. Like if you're, if you're just an amazing athlete or something, you're like, wow, he became an amazing athlete. He always was an amazing. Now he's amazing. Isn't he amazing? Like, okay. But if something happens in spite of your flaws with your flaw, like, well, that's God. He gets the credit for that. Right. Mm -hmm. It's interesting too. Like they, they brought a blind guy to Jesus. So there's an obvious weakness. And they're like, whose fault is this? Cause they, they believe they have a disability, a weakness. You're cursed. That's what our culture believes too. all cultures that really you're, you don't measure up You're cursed. And they asked him who is responsible, his parents or him who sinned. And he's like, he's not cursed. This happened so that God could be glorified. Like your weakness, whatever it is telling you becomes this, this opportunity for God to get the credit. And hopefully there's all, we're all a mixed bag with motives. We all are. And including me. I don't know if I've ever had a pure thought in my entire life, but there's not at least a grain of me in there. Like that said, that said, there's a lot of me that really is like, I hope people don't walk away going, wow, Brant's really awesome. More than like, wow, Jesus is really interesting and he's really awesome. And I'm glad Brant gets to be my brother in this, but uh, yeah, I'm not following him. I'm following Jesus. So I hope that answers the question. It's it's amazing to watch that happen where God will use your weakness be, because that's how he is made strong. That's how people see him. Yeah. Man, what a better way to end that show. Like I don't think there could have been a point in time that we could have ended so perfectly. Just hearing him talk about Asperger syndrome and all of the things that he's experienced in his life that would nine times out of 10, you would think it would hold you from having a career in communication, but to be as well established as he is with Ted talks, massive radio success books, essentially having a life, a lifelong career in communication with overcoming those obstacles is beyond encouraging to me. I couldn't agree more. Um, I think when, when anybody's faced with adversity, whether it's a circumstance or even a diagnosis, um, to have the courage to just keep going, as what he said right right when it ended. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's it takes a lot, and sometimes I think the ignorance of not really understanding the gravity of your situation can help propel you too, because you don't really realize everybody else is like, oh, he's got this, or oh, she's got this, and. And they feel bad for you, but you're not thinking anything of it. You're just going, you know what I'm saying? You're just doing, it's kind of similar to your story. You know, you've dealt with a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression, yeah. a lot of stuff, but you just and get I up love, every day. Yeah. Like yeah. it was never one of those things when I started getting vulnerable about anxiety and depression and all of the things that were going on in here. Yeah. Never once was I like, oh yeah, I'm going to get a million views off of this message. It was like, <laughs> no. I found a strange comfort, which I believe is the Holy Spirit, honestly, of just a blanket of comfort with being vulnerable. And then when, even before people started sharing their stories of how it helped them, it was therapy for me. And even to this day, like every, almost every single episode that we do feels like therapy. It genuinely, you're, you, there's so many things you can relate with people on, um, for him, having the communications issues growing up and he turned that weakness, as he said, the weakness is where he found his purpose, right? It's, yeah. it's mind boggling. We all are all different. Well, I think, you know, there's so many, it, it calls into question what you're really doing, what you're doing for. Cause if it's truly your purpose, no amount of obstacles, no amount of anything in your way is going to stop you from living out that purpose. Now, if you're in it for the, the attention and things like that, you'll find yourself challenged along the way. But when you're doing it for the right reasons, when you're doing it to genuinely be a blessing to somebody else, it doesn't matter what's happening. You're not, you're not performing for other people. You're doing what you truly are. You're, 
you're, you're walking it out on a daily basis. You can't do anything else because this is what you were designed to do. And so that's what I really just listening to Brant and his whole story is, was incredible. And, and that's exactly what he's doing. He's living out or living by design, so to speak, to, to, mm -hmm. to button it up perfectly, to, to say it without much more yeah. <laughs> speculative conjecture or whatever you want to speculative Grant conjecture. Grant Hansen. Yeah, not to be con <laughs> Do it. Go ahead. Say it again. Bernard Tate. Brant Hansen. Not to be confused with handsome. Right? <laughs> Dude, that joke brought to you by Transparent Media Company <laughs> in correlation with Cure International. <laughs> and it will be here all week. No, no uh, Cure International bringing them up. Just the fact that Brant, I brought up our tagline for Transparent Media with him. Uh, media that matters. Like he's able to wake up and do his radio show and media and all of the above with the blanket of knowing that like it's sponsored by cure international. It's not like yeah. a, just the financial sponsorship to help support the show and everything. He's able to reach people with this message that cure is doing across the globe. And more recently they were in Afghanistan up until everything started hitting the fan, you know, and they're still right. there, but <laughs> like they're not able to run the hospital like they were. They literally had hospitals strategically to where they could tell people about Jesus because in these under impoverished or uh, more impoverished areas across the globe, they're not able to hear about Jesus. They're not able, when you are born with a defect or something like that, it's, Oh, who sinned and who are we going to hold accountable? You're this way because somebody cursed you and they go in and say, no, you're not cursed. This is where Jesus can be glorified and they help them out. So I found that's one of the key takeaways other than knowing that Brant is like, my long lost older brother of some yeah. sort. I claim him <laughs> as my own now. Oh, and awesome. um, it's phenomenal, dude. But his new book, The Men We Need, is available everywhere because he's Brant Hansen. Like, <laughs> go to BrantHanson.com, <laughs> Amazon, Barnes and Noble, wherever you can find it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and the audio version is on Audible. <laughs> Be sure to go check out his podcast with the beautiful Sherry Lynn called The Brant and Sherry Oddcast. Because, yes, they are odd people. And we're odd too, Brian, but we don't have a cool name like that. No. Kind of, you know what? Kingdom <laughs> business. Let's go. Oh, hey, what up? No. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> dude. Thank you for sitting in for this after show. I, I absolutely enjoy being able to just summarize and piece everything together. And for everyone listening, thank you so much for being here. And uh, we love you so much. Be sure to like and subscribe. Uh, go find us on IG, wherever. Gator, uh, <laughs> Facebook, Pivot. Gator done. Gator done. We love you guys so much. I hope you know that you have so much purpose in your life. Jesus loves you. And if you need extra you support, loved. need somebody to talk to, uh, be sure to reach out to Heart Support, Death to Life, the Teen Hope Line, uh, Beneath the Skin. There's so many people that want to speak with you. And there's so many more that we could list out, but we ain't got time for that. So many so, amazing resources. So many amazing resources are out there, and we love each and every single one of them equally. But as always, we'll talk to you guys next week. Goodbye now. Peace.